Well, good morning. As Chad said, we are in a new year, which means we are starting a new series. We actually started it on January 1st. And in case you're wondering, wait a minute, I didn't know we had church service that morning. The reason I say we started on January 1st is because it started with a reading plan. And so if you are not already engaged in reading in God's Word, I would encourage you to jump in with us as we read through the Bible from cover to cover. If you're already reading the Bible, you have another plan you're using, then that's great. You're engaging in God's Word. And that's the biggest thing that really matters. But as we walk through as a church family, and we read through Genesis 1-1 through the end of Revelation 22, we have titled this series, Threaded. And uh, so I, I had a great time, my family and I did, as we were away for Christmas and New Year's, and yet I've been excited and anxious to get back today because I knew we were kicking off this new series. Um, and, and I've also been excited to see how many of you and some of your friends and family have begun to engage in God's Word in, in, in this series. It's been incredible to see on Facebook. I don't, I don't know if you're on Facebook or not, but all too often there's a lot of drama and negative stuff on Facebook. But this week I've seen God do some incredible things through Facebook just simply by people going online and saying Genesis 1 through 3 or Genesis 4 through 6 or Genesis 10, uh, I, I skipped some numbers there, I think, but you see the rhythm that I'm listing. And, and you may be saying, what are you talking about, just 1 through 3 and 4 through 6? The, the deal is, we are trying to read through the Scripture together, and we have a reading plan. If you don't have access to it, haven't picked it up, it's actually available on a rack right outside in the uh, foyer or, or the hallway. If you are a friend of mine on Facebook, you'll probably see me post every single day the reading. And then also, on the back of your worship guide every week, on the very bottom underneath the sermon notes, is the reading for that week. Now, that one's not broken down into Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's the whole week. I, I would encourage you a couple of things. Number one, don't read God's Word legalistically and say, I've got to do it just because that's what's expected of me. Instead, read it for a desire for a relationship with God. And then secondly, if you miss a day, don't try to make it up the next day. Just read the day for that, that calendar date and stay current with us, and I think you'll be blessed as you move through. But it's been really neat because I've got friends in other states, and I've got friends of friends that are messaging me and sending Facebook messages and, and posting on Facebook as we are reading God's Word together. And so the desire is that we would see what the big picture of Scripture is all about. So that's kind of where we're going this year, and, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to an exciting year of walking through God's Word together. So if you do not already have your worship guide available to the backside, I encourage you to do that because that's some sermon notes as we go along. If you don't already have your Bible or your uh, Bible on your device or whatever, grab that, go to Genesis chapter 1, or you can grab a Bible if uh, you don't have one with you that should be near you underneath a chair around you. If you don't own a Bible or you need one, feel free to take that home with you. That is our gift uh, to you. We want everybody to have access to God's Word. Before we jump into Genesis, though, I thought I would, would look at a little bit of material here. If you um, have seen the title of the series, Threaded, it makes sense maybe to you that I'm looking at some material. So I've, I've got some material here. I, I'm quite sure you know what the end out, outcome of this piece of material is, right? It's pretty descriptive, right? You know exactly what's going to happen with this material. Anybody know? Okay. So the idea is this material is not much to look at. Now, don't get me wrong. I see that it has A&M on it, and so therefore it's worth something, I guess, to some of us. Um, but in and of itself, each one of these little pieces don't tell you much, right? But then whenever you start putting pieces together and start sewing them together, then the picture begins to come into play. So you see this, this piece together, and then this piece together. And then if you had enough of these pieces, and enough of this thread, you would have a different outcome. You see, without this thread, these pieces of material don't really show you too much. But when you take that thread and begin to thread it through the material, you see the outcome and you see the big picture. So if you take about 500 or the, of those little pieces, then you come out with this. And I will tell you, I did not make that, but it is a quilt that's an A&M quilt that's made up of each of these pieces. You see, I could throw all those pieces down on the floor, but without the thread, they don't really come together, right? And so as we look at God's Word together, 
As we look at Genesis or Exodus or Matthew or Revelation or 1 Peter or Jude or any other book of the Bible, whenever we look at them individually, we are just seeing a snapshot if we're not careful and we're not seeing the big picture. So what we're doing with this series is seeing what the common thread is that moves throughout all of Scripture so that we can understand Scripture better. You see, if I just take each individual piece then I either don't have the big picture or I might have a wrong picture. And so as we start this year off together, I want us to look at what I call, and many other people call as well, a a grand narrative of Scripture. You see, whenever you think about the Bible, I don't know if you know how many books of the Bible there are, but there are 66 books. And, And there are probably 40 authors that put this together and about 1,500 years of writing. If you're not careful, when you look at those facts, you may think that the Bible is just a collection of writings or an anthology, when in reality, the Bible has one seamless story weaved or woven, whatever the right word is, throughout the entire text, and we want to see what that common thread is. So this morning on the notes, you're going to be able to follow along as we look at some of that, th- those pieces of a grand narrative of Scripture. And then additionally, I've got another little resource that will be available after the service, and it will show you um, kind of what the big picture of Scripture is that will go hand in hand with the message this morning. So whenever we dismiss, there should be some of these available on the table right outside in the hallway. I'd, I'd encourage you to pick one of those up. So, what is the central story of Scripture? The central story of Scripture is Jesus and our need for him. Uh, This morning, we sang a bunch of songs about Jesus, and in reality, every single one of them ties directly into the portion of Scripture that we read this past week, which is Genesis 1 through 12. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus' name doesn't show up at all in the text. So what are you talking about? The truth of the matter is, from beginning to end, there's one story of Scripture, and that is we are sinners in need of a Savior, and He comes to bring us salvation. And so this morning, we're going to look at this grand narrative of Scripture. It it, it has four acts, A-C-T-S, if you will, of Scripture. And and down your notes, if you want to jot down the four acts, they correspond with each uh, statement here. The first one is creation. The second one is redemption. The third one is, um, I'm sorry, the second one is fall. The third one is redemption. I'm sorry if you're writing in ink and I messed you up. The second one is fall, F-A-L-L. The third one is redemption. And the fourth one is restoration. So I want us to look at each chapter or each act of Scripture that we're going to actually find unfold before our eyes in the book of Genesis. If you will, turn to the very first verse of the Bible, which is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to see here Act 1, which opens, which is creation. We see that everything begins and ends with God. Genesis 1, 1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you're looking at the Bible to be a scientific book to describe every in and out of the science involved to the creation story, you're not going to find it. But what you are going to find is a presupposition that is true, and that is that God created everything. And on your notes there, we see that it begins with him, and therefore God created everything, and it was very good. If you've ever read Genesis 1, perhaps you read it this week, perhaps you've read it other times in your life, if you've ever read Genesis 1, you know that there is an account of the creation of the universe in six days. If you've looked at it a little bit closer, you may see that there is a repetitive pattern of creation. For us to see that, I want us to read verses 3 through 5. This is just day one. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Every single day of creation tells the similar pattern, and here it is. It starts with the statement, 
where God says, let there be. Whatever he's creating in the moment, let there be light. Or <clears throat> let there be uh, trees. Whatever he creates, he says, let there be. And then every time after it says, let there be, it says it was so. Whatever God speaks comes into being. Whatever God says happens. And then at the end of every day, he reflects on his creation and he makes the statement, and it was good. So throughout scripture, I mean, sorry, throughout creation, in Genesis chapter one, we see this repetitive action of God speaking something into existence. It happens and it's a good thing. You may have noticed in my notes, though, it says that it was very good. So why did I include the word very? Some of you write, uh, stories and you had to do it for school and you had to have 500 words, you had 497, so you added a few varies in there to make the 500. But the reason very is there is because of a very important uh, reason. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It's the last verse of chapter 1. It says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. For us to truly understand this first act of Scripture, which is creation, we have to understand that it was very good. Why, why does he say it's very good? Because he created everything and it was done, it was complete, he was able to see the big picture of everything put together. He was also able to see something that was free of sin, it was perfect, there was no blemish, no marking against it. Also, verse 31 comes on the heels of the description that he had created man and woman, which was the pinnacle of his creation. We see here that God is sovereign. We see that God is in charge. We see that God is holding this whole thing together and that he is powerful. I want us to now look back about the description of mankind because for us to see the importance of creation that then moves into the second act, we've got to see him create mankind. Look at verse 26. It says, Then God said, let us make man in our image. Let me pause for a second. You're like, whoa, 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 just saying, why does it say us? It says, God said, let us make. Who else is there? God's the only one that's there. We have a picture already in its infancy stage of the Trinity in the, in the first chapter of the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one yet, yet three in one. And so there we see him say, let us. Continue in verse 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We see that mankind is the pinnacle of God's creation. We see that it was very good because at this point in the garden, the Garden of Eden, everything was established and in place and in order and proper and good and perfect and clean and free of sin and operating exactly as God designed it to be. I want us to see that. I want you also to understand that this act of creation, while it only shows up the first time in Genesis, and then it's briefly described in other places where it talks about how, how Jesus was active in creation even when we moved in the New Testament. The, the purpose of creation shows up over and over again throughout Scripture from front to back as we see God's intention that we would live our lives reflective of who he is in his image, living as image bearers of his. So we have to see that his original intent was, was a life that was made to be in perfect harmony with him and in perfect harmony with each other and all of creation. That's what Adam and Eve have at this point. Their relationship with each other, with God, and with creation is as it should be. Now, that perfection does not last very long at all. You have chapter 1 of Genesis that tells about it. You have chapter 2 that tells it again kind of in different language, but it's the retelling of the creation. And included in chapter 2, we see one command that God gives to mankind. Look at chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So everything is perfect. They're in right relationship with God, but God gives them one commandment, and he says, don't eat of this tree. If you know the story very well, you know that chapter 3, we enter the second act. And the second act is the fall, F-A-L-L. That's not the time of year, but instead it's kind of a theological term that we'll look a little bit closer at what the fall is all about. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. This is an encounter that the serpent uh, has with Adam and Eve, specifically Eve. And the serpent, of course, is, is representative of Satan and the temptation that he brings into the occasion. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may, eat of the tr- free, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Side note right here. Satan is getting Eve to doubt God's word and who he is. And he's beginning to cause her confusion, and she begins to quote God, and she's not even quoting God correctly here. So he's twisting what God has said because he doesn't want them to truly understand who God is. When you and I read God's word, if we're not careful, we can get it twisted as well. So we've got to be careful to read God's word closely. It says in verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to the hus- her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed thick leaves together and made themselves loincloths. We see right here on the notes that Adam and Eve disobeyed God and that caused all of mankind to fall into a state of sin and corruption. So this very first sin that we see in Scripture is the encounter where Eve is tempted to take of the fruit that she's been told not to eat and yet because of her temptation from Satan, she chooses to take it because she wants what looks good to her. She wants to make decisions for herself. She doesn't want to be told what to do. She wants to decide for herself what is good and evil or she wants to be a part of that. She thinks God's withholding something from her and she chooses to go her own path. And right then and there, sin enters into the world, and no longer is creation perfect, but now sin is, uh, the creation is marred by sin. And because of that, you and I live in a world full of sin and chaos and destruction and corruption and, and, and despair and fear and pain and agony, because it's all a result of the fall that we fell from God's standard of perfection and experienced something much less than what God intended for us. We see that sin immediately disrupts their relationship with God. Keep reading in verse 8. In verse 8, we see the reaction to, to this sin in their life. It says, they heard, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. In creation, Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with one another and with God and with all of creation. As a result of the sin and the fall, everything was distorted and changed, and instantaneously they ran from God. They were scared of God. They were afraid of him. They knew they had sinned. They didn't know how he would react. They knew that their relationship with him had been severed. And, and, And we find Adam hiding from the God that he had walked closely with prior to that. 
That's how our relationship with God is impacted as well. As a result of sin and the fall, mankind falls from the ideal that God has for us into sin, darkness, corruption, and death. You can see that's the case by looking at our world. You can see that's the case by reading the Scripture. If you read Genesis 1-12 through with us this week, time and time and time again, we see sin creeping into the lives of the people in the Bible. In fact, the story of Noah that's found in that same text of Scripture happens because all of mankind was so wicked and depraved that God said, I'm going to wipe it all out, save Noah and his family. So all throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we see this recurring theme of of the fall, that creation was intended for us to be in perfect standing with God, but because of the fall and because of sin, we are so far from God's intention. If you're familiar with some of the passages in Romans, we know that according to Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So every single one of us in this room, every single one of us in this room have been created to bring glory to God and to be in right standing with him. But every single one of us in this room, because of the sin in our lives, are eternally forever separated from God short of his answer to our sin problem. You see, there's nothing that you and I can do to be in right standing with God in and of ourselves. You could read this entire Bible with us this year and that doesn't put you in right standing with God. You could be at church every single Sunday and that's not gonna put you in right standing with God. You could be the best neighbor or the best worker in the world. You could be the most loving person you can think of. None of those things put us right with God because all of us have a sin problem. And the Bible says, That whenever sin enters into the equation, death enters. Our physical death, our spiritual death, forever separated from God. In fact, if you haven't already, you may want to take the time later today to read uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 24, which outlines all of the punishment that comes about because of their sin. One of those is they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. The Bible says that every one of us is a sinner. The Bible says, thankfully, that there's an answer. So that takes us to the third act, which is redemption. Redemption says that even as God issued out the punishment, he pointed to a coming redeemer. Even while God was punishing Adam and Eve, He at the very same time pointed to hope and redemption and the ability for our sins to be forgiven. And I don't want us to miss this because if we're not careful, we'll read through Genesis 1 through 3 and not see Jesus in this account. Look with me at Genesis 3 verses 14 and 15. God's speaking to the serpent and he says, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then listen to 15. 15 says, I will put enmity or hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your heel and you, sorry, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If you look at verse 15, you see the promise of a coming Messiah. Think about Jesus' crucifixion. Whenever Jesus was killed on the cross, Satan thought he had won. When in reality, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection crushes Satan and defeats him. And so here is God saying to Adam and Eve, and sure, they don't understand the full picture yet, and yet we can, looking back at it now, see that what, G- what God was pointing to was the fact that an offspring was coming through Eve, ultimately to bring salvation to mankind. 
Now, that is some good news that we see from the very beginning in Genesis that the truth of the gospel comes throughout all of Scripture. You see, in the Old Testament, there's a continual promise that a Messiah would come and that he would bring salvation. Then we move to the New Testament and to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and we see the story of Jesus and how he brings salvation to those who would trust in his name. But that story line begins even in the Old Testament, even in the Garden of Eden. There's a theological term to, to refer to this verse. It's called the Proto-Evangelium or Evangelion, and, and it means first gospel or first proclamation of the gospel. And so in Genesis 3.15, we see the promise of a Messiah that would come to bring salvation. The Bible is clear that because of our sins, that we are entrapped in our sin. We're in bondage because of our sin. We are eternally separated from God because of our sin. But the good news is that God sent his son Jesus to live a life that we couldn't live, to die a death that we deserve, so that if we place our faith and our trust in him, then we can experience the redemption or forgiveness of our sins. The word redemption carries with it the concept of paying something back. We should pay with our lives because of our sin, but Jesus paid the price for us. We've been singing this morning about our Redeemer and how he lives and how there's salvation in him. This Redeemer is none other than Jesus Christ, and he shows up very early in the Scripture when, when God says that the offspring of Eve would crush the head of Satan. That is something to celebrate as we read God's word that we see time and time again the thread of the gospel that goes throughout the scripture from the start to the finish. So we see the, the three acts that we've looked at so far. We, we've looked at the fact that <clears throat> that, 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 that creation was perfect just as God designed it. That sin enters the equation and, and humanity falls into sin. That that sin separates us from God. But the good news is that we have a redeemer that is coming or has come for us, yes. But was coming even in Genesis chapter 3. As we continue to read the scripture together, you're going to read some parts of the Old Testament, perhaps you're familiar with, that will be very, very detailed about sacrifices and how they had to be done properly and, and what kind of sacrifice to bring if you had this sin or that sin. And, and it describes it at length. And at times, I'll be honest with you, it can be quite exhausting to read the depth of those sacrificial systems. But as you read that in the next few weeks in, in, in the Old Testament, as you read it, see that that's actually pointing to the one Savior, Jesus Christ, that would be our final sacrifice for our sins. Flip with me, if you don't mind, to the New Testament. Flip to Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we will see the picture of the sacrifices in the Old Testament and how they tie in to Jesus. Re, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 through 14. The author of Hebrews is talking about the sacrificial system and the priesthood in the Old Testament and how Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, how Jesus is the ultimate high priest for us to forgive us of our sins. And he describes it this way. Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So in the Old Testament, Whenever the people would make sacrifices to God, they would be trusting in him for salvation, looking towards a coming Messiah, and that coming Messiah is Jesus Christ himself. 
So we see this third act of Scripture throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, is the need for a Savior, the need for a Redeemer, the need for the forgiveness of sins. And that answer is Jesus Christ. It always has been and it always will be. In Scripture, we see that Jesus is the only name by which man must be saved. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. We see that right here in the redemption that's available through him. You see, Jesus and what he did on the cross and in his resurrection brings us hope, brings us new life, brings us forgiveness, and puts us in right standing with God. Act four. Act four is restoration. In some ways, restoration and redemption can feel the same. Ultimately, what the difference is between those two things is that with redemption, we're forgiven of sin, and yet we still live in a world that is impacted by the brokenness of sin and the fall. But one day is coming where we'll be free from the presence of sin and in the presence of God himself. And therefore, all things will be restored. It says on your notes, one day all will be restored and we will be in the literal presence of God. We see the story of Scripture begins in the book of Genesis in a place that's called the Garden of Eden. And then we, as we move forward in Scripture and end up in the final book of the Bible, Revelation, we end up in a garden there as well. In the Old Testament, in the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect and and as it should be, but then sin entered the equation, and so for the rest of this earthly life, sin will continue to impact everything around us. And yes, there's redemption in Jesus Christ, but we're still affected by the outcome of sin in our lives because of our sins and other people's sins, even as we continue to live in this life. But one day, Jesus is coming back as a conquering king, and he will make things right again. And we will be in his presence. Those of us that have placed our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and him alone will be in his presence in a garden around his throne. Look at Revelation chapter 22. It's the final book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. We must read this to remember that ultimately a day is coming where all things will be made new again. Revelation chapter 22 We're going to look briefly at verses 1 through 3. It says this. This is a revelation of what heaven is like and being in the presence of God. And so John, who's writing this down, is having this experience. And it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, See if you remember this tree from Genesis. The tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. What we need to see here is this, that the day is coming when Christ will make things new again, and we will be taken from this world of sin and be put in his very presence. Yes, at that day, we will be free from sin forever. Now, don't get me wrong, there's also the flip side, which is the negative, and that is there are those who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus, and on that day, they won't be in the presence of God. Instead, they'll be in a place called hell that's completely void of God's presence. But for those of us who have placed our faith and our trust in him, all things will be made right again. As a kid... We used to sing some of the old hymns and some of the old songs that, that are familiar to the faith. And, and I, I used to be curious when we would sing some of them. I'm not going to sing them for you now, but here are some of the songs. And perhaps you'll recognize the songs and some of the lyrics from it. A song called Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. 
or when we all get to heaven, or when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there, or I'll fly away. Do you know the common theme of all four of those songs? It's talking about the days that we'll be in glory land in heaven. And as a kid, I wondered, why in the world are we so happy about a song that talks about being dead from this earth? And then the older I get, the more I see that is a great thing to sing about. Because our old bodies will wear out and tear out. Our, our lives are infested with sin and uh, impacted by sin because of sin being all around us. But the day is coming when we can be in the presence of God, free from the power and presence of sin, and in, in the garden just as God originally intended it. So as you read the Bible this year, I would challenge you, to look for these recurring themes of creation, fall and the effects of the fall, the fact that we have a redeemer and redemption is available, and the promise that all things will be made right in that final restoration. So the purpose for this morning was to see that it's all included in the book of Genesis minus the restoration. We're able to read that in Revelation. But that, that all of this is the groundwork through which we should read all of Scripture. Because if we don't, if we don't see that, that there is a consistent thread of the gospel coming through it, then when we read portions of Scripture, we'll just see random pieces of cloth. But when we see how it all fits together, we'll begin to see those pieces come together into that beautiful quilt of the truth of God's Word that is threaded throughout it. My challenge for you, not only this year, but through all of life, is to see that Jesus Christ himself and the gospel message that he shares is the thread through all of Scripture. Depending on how close you are to me, you may or may not be able to see this thread. Thread is typically pretty thin and pretty hard to see. There'll be times that you read God's Word and you're like, Alan says that Jesus is in this portion of Leviticus, but I sure can't find it. Alan says that, that Jesus is in every thread of Scripture, and yet I read a genealogy and boy, I went to sleep. I couldn't read all those names. The reality is this. Regardless of where you open God's Word up, we're challenged and called to see the thread of the hope that is found in Jesus Christ and him alone and our very need for him because of the sin in our lives and the hope that one day everything will be made new again when we're in the presence of God himself. So this morning I ask you, While all of us have been impacted by the fall, all of us have been impacted by sin, have you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus and in him alone? Have you placed your faith in him for salvation? I, I, would, I would entertain the thought that if we're not careful, that just as you pull on these individual threads, on this material, and things begin to unravel and fall apart, that things in your life will begin to unravel and fall apart if you're not holding on to the thread of the gospel message of Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation. This morning, I want to pray for us. And as we pray, I would challenge you to consider your own life. Have you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus? And if not, would today be the day of salvation? What about people in your lives that, that, that they need the, to know the hope of Jesus? They're probably not going to pick up the Bible and begin to read in, in the Bible, but they have you in their life, and you can begin to pour into them and point to the fact that, that they are created in God's image, that, that sin has interrupted God's intention, and that without the Redeemer, they are hopeless. But because of the Redeemer, there is a hope to live for. So this morning, let us consider the truth of God's word and do something with it as he's calling us to do. Let me 